my mother's father went to the Naval Academy, graduated in 1930, uh, became a naval aviator at the, and uh, flew during World War II. My father also went to the Naval Academy, uh, graduated in 1951, became a naval aviator, flew during Vietnam, and so when I thought about the path I needed to take to become an astronaut, it was pretty easy just to go with family tradition and follow in their footsteps and uh, come here to the Naval Academy and go into naval aviation as well. some of the more memorable experiences while you were at NASA? Well, I have a lot of memorable experiences from NASA. It's really hard to condense uh, you know, 14 years of working there and a, a very short answer. Um, I think I should start by saying it had been my childhood dream to be an astronaut ever since watching Neil Armstrong on the moon when I was 10. That, that had been my dream. I wanted to fly in space. so. Obviously, that first rocket launch uh, will always have a very fond spot in my heart. The uh, first time I got to look out the window and look back at the planet, obviously a very emotional event for me. At that point, I realized that all that 25 years of hard work and lots of up and down and blood, sweat, and tears, so to speak, had finally paid off and I was living my dream. Uh, uh, I got to do some amazing things at NASA. I think some of them more significant experiences I had involved working with the Russians as part of the Shuttle Mir program. You know, somebody who was commissioned during the Cold War, I never thought I would end up in Russia one day. If I did, it would probably not be a good f for good reasons, uh, but then to suddenly be at the cosmonaut training facility in Star City and working side by side with people that you trained to go to war with, but now we're friends with, that really was quite remarkable. Could you talk a little bit about working with the Russians? Like how you, you know, once we, we got past uh, the stereotypes that had been developed during the Cold War, uh, it was really uh, fun getting to know them one-on-one. -on -one. That probably struck me more than anything, is that when you got to deal with the, the Russian citizens one-on-one, -on -one, they were a very wonderful group of people, very warm, very caring. They literally would give you the shirt off their back. Even though they didn't have a lot, they would give it to you. We had several Russian citizens working for us in the small NASA office in Star City, Russia. The, it's the training, cosmonaut training facility. And we would go to one another's apartments and houses and share dinners together. Uh, do fun activities together. So it was really, really quite an interesting experience, like I said, to move past those stereotypes and realize that we were just people and we had a lot in common and we had a lot that we could learn from one another and a lot that we could share with one another and give to one another. Uh, how similar or uh, different is the astronaut corps from like a flight squadron? Actually, the astronaut office uh, in many ways is quite similar to being in a, um, any military unit. Uh, keep in mind that virtually all the first astronauts were from the military. Many of the people who came to work at NASA in the early days of the space program had military backgrounds, and so they brought the military's approach to planning a mission to NASA. They brought that sense of teamwork and camaraderie to NASA as well. Uh, so, to me, it was a very familiar environment. I glad I was very glad I'd gone through flight training because learning how to fly the shuttle was very similar to learning how to fly some of the aircraft that I flew in the Navy. So. Uh, I, it was a comfortable transition for me because it, uh, particularly uh, uh, the fact that you're probably 40% of the astronaut office at the time were military and people in my astronaut class. One of them was actually a classmate of mine from the Naval Academy, so it was comfortable, it was familiar because we had a common background. 
Uh, how did you, uh, did you want to become an astronaut at first? Yeah, well, like I said, ever since I was 10 years old, uh, sitting in front of a black and white television growing up in Southern California, uh, when I watched Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin bounce along that lunar sur surface, you know, that was it. So yeah, ever since I was 10, that was my dream. And I owe a lot to the Naval Academy, I owe a lot to the Navy for giving me, a, one, a great academic background, uh, two, uh, a lot of operational experiences. I think that prepared me well to be selected as an astronaut and to then go on and fly four shuttle missions. And uh, what was the moment like when you were first selected, when you first heard you were going to be an astronaut? I was actually teaching at the Naval Academy at the time, and I was uh, sitting at my office, and I got a phone call, and it was a gentleman named Don Putty who worked at the Johnson Space Center at the time, and I remember his question quite well. He introduced himself, and he said, well, uh, I was just wanting to know if you were still interested in being an astronaut, because if you are, we'd like to have you. And I thought to myself, huh, am I still interested? And I said, well, I basically sputtered out a, uh, yes, yes, sir, I am. And so uh, um, obviously I was elated. Well, the funny part of the story is he then went on to say, that, well, your selection has to actually be approved by Congress. We're in the process of doing that, so you can't tell anyone for 24 hours that you've been selected. And I thought, I have this big smile on my face. My office mate, John Ertel, former Marine Corps H-46 pilot, knew what he could tell that this was the phone call. And he looked at me and said, that's the only time I've seen a helicopter pilot hover without being in a helicopter. But I then asked, I said, can I at least tell my parents? And he said, oh, I guess that's okay. But uh, that was a pretty hard 24 hours to uh, keep it secret. But thanks to uh, Professor Ertel, he then proceeded to tell everybody in the physics department that I had been selected. So when I came to, the, to work the next day, there were signs up around the, that building that I was working in saying, congratulations, Lieutenant Commander Lawrence new NASA astronaut. <laughs> All right, uh, how do you think, how did you think it would be different than uh, the Navy? Well, you have to keep in mind that NASA is a civilian agency. And so uh, even though, like I said before, about 40% of the astronaut office at that point in time were people who were still active duty in the military, uh, the, the culture is different. We did not wear uniforms. Uh, we didn't refer to one another by rank. Um, and, you know, obviously there was an emphasis on, you know, we had an operational mission. We had to manage ri risk, similar to what you do when you're planning a mission you know, or you're going to go fly a flight and you want to understand where you might get in trouble during that mission profile and make sure you had plans to address that. All that was a, a fam familiar environment to me. But again, we were at a civilian agency, so we didn't follow strictly military protocol. That sort of world was left behind, but the operational side was still much like what we had done in, uh, in the world of naval aviation. So that, as I said before, made me feel comfortable because that was uh, an environment that I knew well and, and was familiar with and knew how to operate in. Uh, was there a difference in the accuracy that you had to have uh, being in NASA as opposed to uh, being a Navy pilot? No, I think the approach is very similar. Uh, you know, naval aviation can be an unforgiving environment. You, you have to know your aircraft. You have to know the systems. You have to know your emergency procedures. You have to have those committed to memory. You have to sit down before the mission and, and brief, brief it thoroughly. You have to work as a team to be successful. All that is in place when it comes time to fly either on board the shuttle or a mission to the International Space Station. You're, you're a team. Everybody has their own responsibilities to carry out during the mission in order to accomplish it. But we spend a lot of hours making sure we know our systems inside and out, making sure we're, we know what we're gonna do in the various situations that we might encounter during a mission specifically when the system doesn't operate the way it's supposed to. So the approach that I learned in the world of naval aviation, I took with me to NASA. NASA was already using it. 
and uh, it works quite well. So like I said, NASA learned a lot from the world of military aviation and, and still uses it today. Uh, can you talk about the similarities between a mission with the uh, aircraft and a yeah, mission with a shuttle? Well, you know, the shuttle, it's an aircraft that flies very high <laughs> up in space, so we call it a spacecraft instead. But it is still uh, put together in pretty much the same way you put together an, an aircraft, an airplane, a fixed wing, or a helicopter. Uh, you've got individual systems on board that work together to allow the aircraft to fly or the spacecraft to fly. And as an astronaut, you need to know how those systems work because you have to use them to accomplish your mission. So uh, just like when I went through flight training and I was given an operations manual for my aircraft and I studied it system by system and then went to simulators to practice my procedures, that's exactly the same approach you take as a shuttle astronaut when it comes time to train for your mission. You know, we initially went to single system trainers so we could practice each system at, at a, one at a time, then went to the motion-based simulator to integrate all those systems. I think the significant difference is the fact that the shuttle can, it was a much more complicated aircraft, spacecraft. Uh, I had a two-inch thick NATOPS manual for my H-46 helicopter. All my manuals for the shuttle were about a foot high when I stacked them together. So the wealth of information that you had to commit to memory was, I think, orders of magnitude over and above that that you had to do for your operational aircraft. But again, the skills that I learned during flight training and as a young naval, avia naval aviator in operational squadrons, those were the skills that I applied as an astronaut. Right. Was there any, ever a time where you had to use your training, like something went wrong? Houston, the we have fortunately, um, I can honestly say that during my four shuttle missions, uh, we never really had any significant problems. But during your training flow, uh, your instructor team would throw every problem at the book at you, uh, th every problem in the book at you, and so. Yes, everything that you'd learn um, during your NATOPS checks, flying around as a young a aviator practicing your emergency procedures, you know, you um, brought those same skills to the simulator, which more than anything was situational awareness. I think that's the skill that you learn as an aviator to manage your aircraft, to work with your crew, to be aware of what's going on around you as you listen to the air traffic controllers, or you're in the landing pattern, or you're approaching an airport, that developing that sense of being aware of what's going on around you was really critical to doing well as an astronaut, given the pace of things that can happen on board. So yeah, I was really glad that I had that aviation background, because uh, that's essentially what you do. You fly the shuttle. You are a crew member on board that craft, and you have to successfully operate the systems on board in order to accomplish your mission, just like you do on any operational mission in whatever aircraft you flew. Uh, uh, where do you see aviation going in the next century? Well, that's a great question, Where, and I hope to listen to the panel this afternoon, the future of naval aviation, because I, I, I sense where it's headed next is a world of increasing automation. Uh, it's amazing what we're able to do with technology now, and. You know, as a pilot, you want to be at the controls, but I don't, I think uh, that we'll continue to see aircraft develop that don't have the pilot on board, and they'll be remotely piloted, or they'll have the, uh, cap the aircraft will have the capability on board with its computer software to make its own decisions, so. Uh, but this is kind of the age-old question in the world of space as well. Do you send a, a robotic probe out to explore, or a human? Humans have brains. We're really good at problem solving. We're good at being creative when we're faced with a situation that we might not have uh, uh, anticipated. And that skill is not in place yet with robotic aircraft. It's only as good as its software program uh, who put together the, the code on board. So hopefully we will continue to see humans involved in aircraft 
in operating them and making the decisions about how to carry out the mission because that's a skill that I think we still excel at, bringing the human brain power to bear on the mission and figuring out how to most safely execute it and successfully execute it. Is there any message you'd like to give to any Navy sailors out there? Uh, I, yes. Uh, I just had an opportunity to, to tell this to the midshipmen, but I think the message still applies. Uh, when I came to the Naval Academy, it was my dream to be an astronaut. Because of the experiences that I got here at the Naval Academy, I left here realizing I could make that dream come true. And the same goes for the opportunities that I was given in the Navy. I owe a lot to the Navy. I would not have ended up as an astronaut. I would have not had my childhood dream fulfilled without the incredible experiences that the Navy gave to me and opportunities as well. And the Navy offered me an opportunity to get a master's degree at MIT on the Navy's nickel. So what I want to tell the sailors is the Navy can profoundly impact your life. It can make you a much better person. It can give you some opportunities to do things that you never would have imagined when you were a young person. And make sure that you are in a position to t take advantage of those opportunities when they are presented to you. So I'll say that again. Put yourself in a position that when that opportunity is presented to you by your command, you can take advantage of it. And try and make decisions as you advance through your career to keep those doors open for you because there's some amazing things that you can do once you walk through that door. And it can help you get to where you want to be later in life. It can profoundly impact the direction, as I said. It can make your dreams come true. So the Navy, for me, was a great place to be. I, I uh, have a spawn spot in my heart for the Navy and the Naval Academy, always will. And I am profoundly grateful for the, uh, the experiences and the opportunities that they